Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC213, our course on the end times. And um, thank you for joining the class. Let's take a moment to pray, and then we will get started. Could uh, one of us please pray with the class, and we can start? Let's pray. Father Almighty, King of Glory, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for bringing us together. Mm -hmm. We now surrender this class into your hand, that Father, let your Holy Spirit come and lead us. We pray for a spirit of wisdom, spirit of knowledge, spirit of understanding, that what we may learn, Lord God, may impact on us. Let us give us wisdom to spread your word. We pray all this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you once again. All right. So we have been, we started our final lesson uh, on in this course on the end times. So the plan is to finish that and then next week maybe we'll do a full review of the um, entire course. So we were looking at the signs of the end times, the signs of the end times. So I'm going to share the PDF so that we could um, pick up from where we um, paused last week and um, just quickly review a few things and go forward. So what we are doing in this lesson, lesson five, is trying to look at what are the signs that are indicating to us where we are in relation to the start of the final seven years of tribulation. And just, uh, just before that, the rapture will take place. The Lord will come to take the church out of the way, and then the seven years will begin of, of tribulation that will lead us basically from Re Revelation chapter 6 onwards. So how close are we? Now, of course, we cannot predict the date or the month or the year. Uh, we can't do that. But we can get an indication that we are close. And so that's what these signs of the times are for, that we're looking at. So we said one of the biggest most notable signs is of Israel coming together as a nation, which has already happened. Um, this is very significant because a lot of the end time prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled are in relation to the Jewish people and are in relation to Israel as a nation. So that, that, that was very important. So people, uh, the Jewish people began to gather back into Israel over time. And then in 1948, they identified themselves as a nation, an independent nation. In addition to that, what was significant was that they um, recaptured Jerusalem uh, some in 1967. That means Jerusalem, which is a very important city for the Jewish people. They regained control of it, or at least part of that control of that city in 1967. So, you know, Jesus, Jesus said, one generation will see all these things. So if we put this as the starting point, then we say, okay, we don't know how, how big, how long a, a generation is, whether it's 70, 80 years, or, you know, what is the lifespan of a, um, uh, uh, normal, normal human lifespan, or what? It, what? But somewhere in that range is what we're looking at. A, a gen, one generation is going to see all of these things. So, this is just to give us an indication of where we are. And we're not trying to predict the year or the date or anything like that, because we know we cannot when we're not supposed to. The second uh, important sign of the time is that Jerusalem becomes a focal point uh, of conflict. And uh, that again is happening now 
people are very interested and we're always looking at what is happening in Jerusalem, uh, in Israel, particularly in Jerusalem. Because we said that uh, the, and we see this in Revelation 16 and on, that the buildup towards the battle of Armageddon is armies of the earth moving towards Jerusalem, Israel in general and Jerusalem in particular. So God said, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunk drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples. So that is an important uh, observation that we need to look at, keep looking at it. What is happening? How are the nations aligning themselves in relation to Israel and towards Jerusalem? So that's the second uh, uh, sign that we discuss. So we're going to start now from number three and move forward. The third sign we need to look at is about the Temple Mount, the temple being ready to be rebuilt. The reason is, again, a lot of end time prophecies, like we saw in Revelation 13, that this Antichrist who comes, he sets himself up in the temple as God and, and demanding worship. So we say there obviously has to be that temple because he's going to stop the sacrifices. He's going to put himself up to be worshipped. Uh, Death is going to speak blasphemies against God. And we see that in Revelation chapter 13 and also in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, 8 and 9. Um, so there has to be this temple. But like we said in, in a previous chapter, right now on the Temple Mount, there are two um, Islamic monuments or monuments that belong to the Arab people, the uh, Muslims. There is the Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, and there's the Dome of the Rock. They, they, they are both sacred places for the Arabs. And the Jew, Jews are only allowed to come to one side, the Western Wall. So we need to look at that. And that, of course, is a point of is, is the major point of conflict between the Jews and the Arabs. And we need to see, you know, will, how is this temple going to come back? I mean, we don't exactly exact place, but we know that's the Temple Mount. That was where the temple was or used to be. And uh, what we can read, and this has been known for some time, is that there are a group of Jews who are already all set to rebuild the temple if they were given the opportunity. Right? So they've made their plans. They've got everything needed to resume the worship inside the temple, the sacrifices, the sacrificial worship and rituals. They've got everything ready. And uh, it is not a secret. They have a website also. I think it's called the templemount.org. And you can go, everything you can read about, all the preparation, everything is ready. The only thing is they just, OK, give us the place, the place to build this on. And they will, they're ready to do it. So. We are that close to seeing that happen. Now, uh, how and when, uh, you know, we don't know. Just the fact that these people are ready to do it, the Jewish people are ready to do it, got everything in place, and now it's just a matter of the place on which they're going to build the temple. So we are very close, very close. And literally, uh, within months, they would be able to set it up, put everything to build the temple, and you know resume uh, this or to have the sacrifices coming. So that is something to keep looking at. What is going to happen? How are things developing towards that? You know, we have to keep observing. A fourth important thing, sign to look at, is about. The 10 leaders, 10 leaders who are to emerge. Now, 
where do we read about this? Uh, I'll just quickly mention in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel spoke about a time when uh, you know, in, in the image of that he had, um, you know, there was this big image, head made of gold and chest of brass and uh, waist of uh, a chest of silver, I think, and waist of brass and feet of iron, uh, legs of iron, and then the feet was a mix of iron and clay and had ten toes. And Daniel, in his in interpreting that dream with Nebuchadnezzar had, he said, in the days of that kingdom, that is, the mix of iron and clay, God himself will set up his kingdom. That was Daniel chapter 2. And then that is expanded for us in Daniel chapter 7, 8, and 9, where the ten toes are then represented by ten horns or ten leaders. Where will these ten leaders come from? They will come from the region that's a mix of iron and clay. Iron was the Roman Empire. So, you know, when we study Daniel, we will understand this. Um, it was the part of the Roman Empire. And then the Roman Empire now is mixed with clay, which is people from all other nations. So the Roman Empire predominantly covered parts of Europe across the Mediterranean, and then the northern part of Africa. So that's where the Roman Empire was. Uh, and today, that iron is mixed with clay. That means that region is, it has people who were part of the original, uh, you know, people living there, but it's all mixed with people from all the nations, all mixed people have all migrated and immigrated and so on. And, the, and, 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 and in that vision, Daniel chapter 2, because in the days of those kingdoms, when there were 10 leaders emerging, God would intervene. So there are going to be 10 leaders coming out of that region, the region where there was once the former Roman Empire, which now is mixed with people from all other countries, all other nations, which is what we are seeing today. So. We won't restrict, we, while we won't restrict ourselves to the European Union, the European Union is of interest because it covers, overlaps with parts of that which used to be the former Roman Empire. There's an overlap. And uh, so we're looking, you know, parts of Europe, who are these 10 leaders who are going to rise, who are going to come into political significance? Why is that important? Because in Daniel's vision, chapters Daniel 7, 8, and 9, he tells us, we, we will study this in our third year, he tells us that there will be a little horn, a small horn, meaning a very insignificant leader who will come. He will rise up from what used to be the former Greek empire. So he will rise up from that region. And he will subdue three of these ten leaders, meaning he will somehow gain influence over three of these ten leaders. And with their help, he will come into prominence. He will come into, you know, he will be, become the Antichrist, this man who tries to bring in a peace a deal with Israel in the Middle East. So, we are looking at what is happening in this part of the world with interest. Who could be these ten leaders who are emerging? Who could be this little horn who is coming on the scene? And who, which of these ten leaders, three of these ten leaders, he, he's going to gain control over, he'll influence them. So we are watching that. But the main point is, all of this is very possible today. When we look at what's happening in and around Europe and ar around the Mediterranean, that means we're talking about you know, Europe, going all the way from Western Europe to Eastern Europe, and then you cross the Mediterranean, you come over into Turkey and Syria and around the countries all around Israel, come across Northern Africa. and So you're looking at all this region, this area carefully. And we're saying, okay, yeah, we can see, you know, ten leaders coming 
and how these others are aligning themselves um, and and just keeping an eye you know on this region but whatever Daniel wrote in Daniel chapter 7 8 and 9 you know it, it actually can happen before our eyes then leaders a little leader coming and influencing three of them coming into prominence and that leader being able to um, come and set up some peace agreement with Israel it can happen anytime right so that also is of great interest to us as we look uh, in that area and that's a sign because all, only then can the prophecies of the end times be fulfilled number five the fifth sign uh, let me just pause any questions on that um, yeah, you're all with me so far. Any questions? Okay. Feel free to ask any questions. Uh, I'm not purposely turning into Daniel chapter 7, 8, and 9 because um, we will study that, you know, verse by verse in our third year. But I'm just pointing to you uh, to the chapters where these prophecies have been given for us. Um, Another important sign of the end times that we're going to look at, we should be looking at, is the possibility of a global currency system and identification system. Now, we saw this in Revelation 13, you know, when the Antichrist comes, he's referred to as the beast. In Revelation 13, and uh, of course, he's empowered by the dragon, that is Satan. The Antichrist, along with another man called the false prophet, they are going to extend their influence politically and through through a uh, through a economic system and through a religious system. Now, this economic system is such that in Revelation 13 it says, No man can buy or sell unless they get the mark of the beast, which is 666. Now, we don't have to worry about the particular number, 666, you, you know, okay, it's there. But the point is, it is a mark of the beast, an identification system. And only if you accept it, receive that, only then can you engage in financial transaction but you cannot buy yourself without having that mark you know if you thought about this maybe 30 40 years ago you'll say how is this possible you know um, how you know how could you control what people buy or sell and you know uh, how is this possible but today it is possible that you can have a financial system, a global financial system, uh, that you can then say, if you're going to participate in this financial system, you need to have this particular identification, or you have to have this particular way of engaging. You can do that today, right? So, for example, uh, of course, there are many financial systems, many banking systems around the world. Every country has their own, you know, system. But any person sitting in any part of the world can transact financially literally anywhere else. Now, you have your credit card or you have your bank details and you can move money, you can buy or sell globally. It's possible. You know, today you can sit in you know one country and you can make you can make a purchase somewhere else in another country online and you know things can happen globally so the technology and the possibility is in place for what John wrote 2000 years ago in Revelation 13 of course the Lord Jesus revealed it to him and he said this beast is going to control people they cannot buy or sell unless they have the mark of the beast 
He wrote that 2,000 years ago. And here we are today. And we say, yeah, that's possible. It's possible to have a global financial system where people around the world can engage in and you can require some sort of an authentication from them uh, where in this particular case it's a, it's called the mark of the beast so that's very interesting that we are living in a time when revelation 13 can actually be fulfilled before our eyes 40 years ago it would not be possible you know so it's telling us how close we are to where these things can actually take place number six is to see how Russia China Iran and Turkey align themselves so uh, I just want to point us to one verse of scripture one or two verses of scripture if you turn with me to uh, Ezekiel chapter 38 please just to highlight this um, uh, we won't read the whole chapter, but I want to point out something for us. Ezekiel chapter 38. And um, if you read verses um, 1 to 8, Ezekiel 38, 1 to 8. Can somebody read that, please? Ezekiel 38, 1 to 8. Somebody could read it. Anyone? Okay. Um, Ezekiel chapter 38. Verses 1 through 8. So let's just uh, look at it here. He says, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus says the Lord God. Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed in a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togarma, for the, from the far north, and all its troops, many people are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that I gather about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be visited. In the latter years you will come back, come into the land of those brought back from the sword, and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. And then if you... Um, skip now to verse 16 you know, he goes on to say you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land it will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I'm hallowed in you O Gog before their eyes so basically Ezekiel the 38th chapter um, if you look, look back in verse 1 onwards, Gog, the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, Tubal. Now, what some Bible scholars point out for us is Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal are pointing to tribes that belong or are part of Russia today. So that's why when they say Gog and Magog or Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, they said these are pointing to Russia, tribes in Russia. Right? And 
Then you look at verse 5, Persia. Persia is the Bible word, Bible name for Iran, Ethiopia, and Libya. So um, we have these people, these nations. What will happen to them? Verse 16, they will come against Israel. They'll come against this land whom uh, these people who have been brought back into their land. So this is something for us to look at, right? So that's why, uh, let's go back to the notes. Uh, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Togarma, this is in verse 6, Gomer and all its troops and the house of Togarma. So, Turkey, Togarma, Persia, Iran, uh, Ma uh, Gog and Magog, represented by the tribes of Rosh, Meshach, Jubal, that's Russia. So, these are nations that are going to be engaged in coming against Israel. The reason we also mentioned China, although China is never mentioned by name, is because of what we saw in the book of Revelation, where he says, kings from the east, this is Revelation 16, kings from the east begin to move across the river Euphrates towards Israel. So we don't know for sure, because China is not mentioned by name, but kings from the east, talking about leaders from the, uh, you know, armies from the east. So we say, well, it's very likely China is one of those powerful nations that will move from the east, east of Israel. So that's why we're looking at these countries, because we know about Russia, Iran, and Turkey, mentioned in Ezekiel 38. And China, Revelation 16, uh, uh, most likely comes as part of the kings of the East. So how about these nations aligning themselves? How about they positioning themselves? And it's very interesting to see that although um, Russia and China, you know, they don't always see, you know, uh, uh, they, you know they, did, they don't, or to say, maybe they're not 100% aligned, but yet you can see them, you know, building their relationship. And then their influence, Russia and China, over in these areas, Iran and Turkey. So you can see these leaders, and I've just mentioned a little bit here, but you can see how these leaders are interacting with each other. You know, how are the leaders in China and Russia? you know, they're strengthening their personal positions in their own lands, but they're also trying to build bridges with other countries. China has done a lot of work uh, through its um, Belt and Road Initiative, where they have actually invested in se about 70 countries worldwide, and they're kind of building almost like a network of governments who will back them up. So it's almost like if China moves in one way, these other countries are going to move with them because of the kind of influence China already has in nearly 70 countries because of the investments they have made. Right? So China has now become a very influential nation, uh, a superpower um, globally, and is now you know building bridges with Russia as well. So you can see what China is doing in terms of uh, investing, especially in Iran. They've strategically invested over there. Uh, Russia is strengthening its relationship with Turkey. Uh, Turkey is uh, exerting its influence in that part of the world. So it's interesting to see all these nations, how they're lining up with each other. So if one of them were to move in war against Israel, it's likely they're going to bring all of the others in, right? Because they've already invested so much and got them to be on their side. They're going to move um, 
towards Israel. And so the kings of the East could very well be all of these nations who have aligned themselves with each other, moving against Israel. And this is very likely, a very possible. It's a fulfillment of what we see in Ezekiel chapter 38 and also in chapter 39. The next, uh, any question on that? Point number six, uh, are you all with me? Is it clear? Yes? Okay. Yes. Okay. All right, so now let's move to our next point. Number seven, about peace talks with Israel and the plan to divide the land. So. Like we said, Israel as a nation, Jerusalem specifically, has been a trouble spot in the world, right? mainly because of the conflict between the Palestinians and Israel. Um, the Palestinians want a separate identity, a separate nation. They have uh, sections of land on the the west uh, side, called west side, called the West Bank, the west side of Jordan, and also Gaza. Again, another portion of land. They are they're staying there, and um, there's always been this talk: how do we resolve this conflict? And so many, many leaders have tried to establish peace. Right, but. Joel prophesied in Joel chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. He said, For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, that is Megiddo, where the battle of Armageddon is going to take place. I will enter into judgment with them all there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, they have also divided up my land. So, so God is saying, in those days, at that time, after, you know, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, so the people of Judah and Jerusalem, they are back in their own land. They have come back. We saw that. 1948, they were there, recognized as a nation. 1967, they've got back part of Jerusalem. So we are very close to this fulfillment of this. What is happening is the nations are coming against Israel and they are going to divide up the land. So when you look at the solutions that were being proposed for uh, resolving this conflict in the Middle East between Palestinians and Israel, one of the solutions was, let there be two states, let there be, you know, let them have their own place and uh, uh, let the Palestinians have their own place and uh, be given their own identity. Which means Israel is, you know, is going to give up, you know, what they want for themselves, what they consider as really part of their land. So that's been proposed, put forward, but nobody has taken that, you know, to make it real. It's just not possible. Israel will not let it happen. There's the other challenge, which is the control of the city of Jerusalem, especially the Temple Mount. Who's going to control this place? Because the Jews want it, the Arabs want it. Right? So Israel says, hey, all of Jerusalem is our capital. All of Jerusalem belongs to us. That's Israel. And the Palestinians, uh, they say, hey, east of Jerusalem, that's our part. Our part. It belongs to us. East Jerusalem, all of that portion is, belongs to us. So there is debate. There's, you know, uh, the desire to control Jerusalem. And these are two very difficult or two points of conflict that are going on and on and on. Different leaders have attempted so many different things. 
or over the years, right? But eventually, what the Bible is saying is, people will come to divide up my land. So, one of the things that will actually give rise to this ultimate conflict, that is the Battle of Armageddon, where the nations will gather in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, yes, they're going to come to forcibly divide the land, take it out of Israel, and say, no, you've got to give it. So they've come to divide up the land. It means that these two problems have precipitated, have become something so big that nations have gotten involved in it. And they've come to divide up the land. And that's when, as they come into the Battle of Armageddon, God himself will step in. And he says, I will enter into judgment with them for the sake of my people, because they have come to divide up my land. So looking at what's, what, what leaders are proposing as a solution, you know, to this Arab-Israeli Israeli Arab conflict, is, is something we have to keep looking at, because we know the direction this is going to go. We know that ultimately, they are going to try to forcibly divide the land, and that will give rise to this final conflict, the Battle of Armageddon. So it's interesting. Keep looking. What are people trying to propose as a solution to this problem? And what is the direction it's going? Keep looking at it. Right. One more. Well, let's look at a, maybe a couple of more. Um, another important thing to keep looking at is to look at the church. So all these other signs, previous signs that we looked at, were signs outside the church. What is happening in the world? But it's also very important to look at what's happening in the church. Because the Apostle Paul said that when, when the Lord Jesus comes back, he will come for a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Right? So that he might present her to himself as a glorious church. That means when Jesus is coming back, he's going to present the church to himself as a glorious church, not as a weak church, not as a defeated church, not as a divided church, but a glorious church. So in order to bring the church to this place of glory, what do we need? Well, uh, he has put apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints, to edify the body of Christ, that means to build up the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man. That means these ministries are going to be working towards bringing us to that place of maturity. So this is another important thing to look at. We have seen over the last several decades that the minister, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, and pastor and teacher has been restored in the body of Christ. And then these ministries are helping build up the church, build up the body of Christ, and are helping the church come to this place of being a perfect man, to the full measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Right? So that's what we are seeing happen. And um, God is restoring everything in the church. He's bringing the church to be this glorious church. And Acts 3, uh, Peter said, you know, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom heaven must receive, or the word receive actually can be also translated retain. Heaven must retain until the time of restoration of all things. So Jesus is going to be in heaven until the time when everything is going to be restored. And one of the things that will be restored is the church. That the church will be 
brought to this place of restoration. So you look at the early church, you see how powerful it is. We know, you know, the church went through a difficult time in history. But now the church is coming back to its place of strength and glory. And Jesus will be retained in heaven till the time of restoration of all things, including the restoration of the church. So the church is brought to its place of restoration. And then Christ will come. So that's something to look at as we consider the signs. And it's exciting to see that the church is being restored, being brought into this place of maturity. A couple of other things that uh, we can quickly look at, which we are, uh, uh, I would say, are more familiar signs. Number nine is that the gospel must be preached to all the nations, which is something that's happening, right? Uh, like uh, uh, never before in, in history has, uh, you know, there, there never been this many people living on the earth and the gospel having reached so many people all across the world. Yes, there are mm, tribes or there are communities and there are tribes where the gospel has not yet reached, but the gospel is being preached in all the nations. Within those nations, there may be tribes where, um, you know, the, the the final, the last mile, the final efforts are being made to bring the gospel to those people groups. But the big picture is the gospel has reached all the nations, and we are now looking at people groups, which are the people groups that need to hear the gospel. So this is amazing that. This sign, because Jesus said, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a witness to all the nations, to all the ethnic people groups, and then the end will come. So we are looking at the gospel reaching all the people groups, all the nations, and that's in the, and we, are, we can see that we're getting closer and closer to the coming of the Lord. Increased persecution of the church is another indication because Jesus said uh, as he gave the signs of the end times he said look they're going to lay hands on you they're going to persecute you um, yes we know persecution has always been there but there's going to be an increased persecution for uh, my name's sake for the sake of Jesus Christ so we look at that how, how what's happening in the world's re reaction to the church we look at that and see what's happening. There's going to be increased deception, false spirituality, false Christ, false prophets. Again, now these are things that have always been there, meaning it's not new in that sense. There have always been cults and false religions and all that, but it's going to happen in an increased manner. Right? Uh, First Timothy 4, 1 and 2, the Spirit says very clearly in the latter times there will be deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. You know? So that's going to increase when in the latter times. So that's something the Holy Spirit has already spoken to us. Okay, let me pause here. Um, any questions so far? Everybody's with me. Okay, so let's take a break, and um, right after the break, we'll be back in 10 minutes, and right after the break, we'll finish the remaining um, uh, signs of the end times. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, we'll finish the remaining signs, the, uh, maybe just another, I think we just need maybe another 20 minutes uh, after the break, and then we should be done with this lesson. Uh, and then our next step is to do a full review, right? Uh, I will most likely keep the full review for uh, next week. Uh, well, we'll take the two hours just to quickly review. And I'll also encourage you to please uh, ask any questions that you may have about anything in this course that we've covered, right? So let's take a quick break for 10 minutes. I'll be back in 10 minutes, and then we will finish up this lesson 
on the signs of the times. Thank you.